Uh, what's the declension of hey hora? First declension feminine, pure alpha, rho or vowel, hora, horas, hora, horun, hora. Horai, horon, horais, horas, horai. What's the declension of hey phone? First declension feminine, pure eta, phone, phonase, phone, phonane, phone. Phonai, phonone, phonice, phonus, phonai. What's the declension of hey doxa? First declension feminine mixed. Doxa, doxase, doxe, doxon, doxa. Doxi, doxone, doxis, doxus, doxi. What's the declension of hey prophetes? Pardon me, ha prophetes. First declension masculine. Prophetes, prophetu, prophete, prophetin, propheta. Prophetai, propheton, prophetais, prophetas, prophetai. What's the declension of ha logos? Second declension masculine. Logos, logu, logo, logon, loge. Logoi, logon, logois, logus, logoi. What's the declension of ta ergon? Second declension neuter. Ergon, ergu, ergo, ergon, ergon. Erga, ergon, ergois, erga, erga. What's the declension of ha archon, archontas? Third declension masculine feminine. Archon, archontas, archonti, archonta, archon. Archontes, archonton, arcusi, archontas, archontes. What's the declension of tas soma? Somatas. Third declension neuter. Soma, somatas, somati, soma, soma. Somata, somaton, somasi, somata, somata. What's the declension of ha, he, ta? Ha, tu, to, tan, hoi, ton, tois, tus. He, tais, te, tain, hai, ton, tais, tas. Ta, tu, to, ta, ta, ton, tois, ta. What's the declension of ego, su? First and second person pronouns. Ego, emu, amoy, eme. He mace, he moan, he mean, he mus. Su, su, soy, se. Who mace, who moan, who mean, who mus. What are the principal parts of luo? Luo, luso, elusa, leluca, lelumai, eluthing. What's the conjugation of luo in the present active indicative? Luo, lues, lue. Luamen, luete, luci. Infinitive, luing. What's the conjugation of luo in the present middle passive indicative? Luomai, lue, luetai, luamatha, luestha, luontai. Infinitive, luestai. What's the conjugation of ami in the present indicative? Ami, a, esti, esmen, este, ac. What's the conjugation of luo in the imperfect active indicative? Eloan, elues, eloe. Eluamen, eluete, eloan. What's the conjugation of luo in the imperfect middle passive indicative? Eluamen, elu, eluita, eluamitha, eluista, eluanta. What's the conjugation of ame in the imperfect indicative? Amen, ace, ain, amen, eta, asan. What's the conjugation of luo in the future active indicative? Luso, luces, luce. Lusomen, lucite, lususi. Infinitive, lusane. What's the conjugation of luo in the future middle indicative? Lusomai, luce, lucitai. Lusamatha, lusistha, lusontai. Infinitive, lusistai. What's the conjugation of ami in the future indicative? Esomai, esse, estai. Esamatha, esistha, esontai. What's the conjugation of luo in the first aorist active indicative? Elusa, elusas, eluse. Elusamen, elusita, elusun. Infinitive, lusa. What's the conjugation of luo in the first aorist middle indicative? Elusamen, eluso, elusita. Elusamatha, elusista, elusanta. Infinitive, 
lusus thigh. What's the conjugation of lumbano in the second aorist active indicative? Elabon, elabes, elabet. Elabamen, elabete, elabon. Infinitive, labane. What's the conjugation of lumbano in the second aorist middle indicative? Elabamen, elabu, elabata. Elabamatha, elabestha, elabonta. Infinitive, labestai. What's the conjugation of lu in the perfect active indicative? Leluca, lelucas, leluca. Lelucamen, lelucata, lelucasi. Infinitive, lelucena. What's the conjugation of lu in the perfect middle passive indicative? Lelumai, lelusai, lelutai. Lelumitha, lelustha, leluntai. Infinitive, lelustai. What's the conjugation of lu in the pluperfect active indicative? Elelugain, elelugais, eleluke. Elelugamen, eleluketa, elelukesan. What's the conjugation of blue in the aorist passive indicative? Eluthain, eluthes, eluthe. Eluthamen, eluthete, eluthesan. Infinitive, luthani. What's the conjugation of blue in the future passive indicative? Luthesamai, luthese, luthesatai. Luthesamatha, Luthesestha, Luthesantai. Uh, let's pray. Yesu, Huye David, Ele Sonme, Hamartalan. All right. Thank you. All right, tonight, um, two big goals. Um, so, obligatory, like, housekeeping comment. So, up at the top of the recitation, it says it's for chapters 1 through 17. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is without overwhelming us um, today is I kind of want to try to bring all the ideas of 1 to 17 kind of to a close. Um, and there's really only like three really that we need to kind of talk about. So first, um, I want to go to the nouns portion um, of the recitation, the nouns and the pronouns. So I want to do first kind of like a big picture idea of how these um, substantives is kind of the big category. So substantive, just you can think of anything with like substance. Um, and in um, Greek, there are three parts of speech. We're only going to talk about nouns, so I'll give you one of them. Three parts of speech that could be thought of as substantive. So nouns would be one. Can you think of anything else that would kind of have like substance to it, physicality to it? Pronouns. Pronouns would be another one. And the other one could be tricky. As yeah, substantive adjectives. That's exactly right. Um, substantive adjectives. Um, the wicked will perish or something like that. Um, so these would be all the things that have substance. They're called substantives. Um, and so first, um, attributes of substantives as far as how they work in all languages. Some languages have certain attributes. Some languages have other attributes. Um, but what are the things that we could say about a noun or a pronoun or an adjective? Just kind of anything at all. Uh, singular or plural. Okay, good. So we have, they have number, right? Are they singular? Um, pardon me? <laughs> singular or plural, right? Dog or dogs. What else? Um, mm -hmm. What are the word for conjugation? Ooh, yeah, what do nouns do? They don't conjugate. Uh, <laughs> Gonna switch to a darker mark or another dark mark. Let's see. This way. How about um? Declension. Okay, declensions. Okay, so what are declensions about? There are kind of two variables we see in declensions, uh, really all three. So we have singular and plural, right? We have like doxa and doxi, for example, singular and plural. But we also have like ha logos and he doxa. What do we change there? Um. The role that the noun's playing. Okay, so that's the second thing. Do you remember what we call that? The role? It changes, yeah, so this is called case. So, case languages, um, just think of in English, right, the difference between like he versus his versus him, right? That's really the essence of it. What's the job it's going to do in the sentence, and then it's going to change its form depending on what it's doing. So is it a subject? Um, it'll go into the, in English they tend to call it the subjective case, the possessive case, or the objective case. But in Greek, we have uh, five other cases, right? So we've got nominative, 
genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, right? So that's all about the whole, the role, it, it changes to look different depending on the job or the role or um, when we would teach this to third graders, we, um, we would always talk about the hat the noun is wearing. So it's like, um, you know, oh, do I need to put on my worker construction hat because I'm going to the construction job? Or do I need to put on my baseball cap because I'm playing baseball? Whatever. Whatever metaphor you want to use, that, that helps. Um, that could be helpful. We, also, kids used to do puzzles. They don't do puzzles anymore. So I used to talk about, like, the puzzle piece shape, you know. So it's like, oh, that'll be a corner piece. But kids don't know what puzzles are, apparently, anymore. So, so I had to drop that metaphor and uh, stick to others. Okay. So number, case, and there's one more. Ha versus hey versus ta, for example. Gender. Gender, good. So we have those three genders, right? We have masculine, feminine, and neuter. This can be a little tricky, um, but I'll just I'll make this comment. So in, in um, gendered languages, um, mm -hmm. word, uh, sorry, uh, nouns and pronouns specifically, adjectives are a little different, right? Because adjectives could change to match a noun, right? You could have an evil man or an evil woman or something. But with nouns and pronouns in particular, um, I'll just stick with nouns for now, like you just have words that are a gender, like glory. Glory is feminine. That's not to say that only feminine things can be glorious or whatever, it's just that's what it is. Um, and that can be bizarre, honestly, like um, especially like, you know, students when they're learning like Latin or Spanish or something for the first time Greek, you know, they're like, Wait, why, why is, uh, you know, house feminine? Oh, is it because women work in the house? Like, so, sure, no. Yeah, no, I mean, it could be, but that's not it. Okay, so, and then the last thing, and you kind of already hit on that, is there are these declensions, right? And could you think of kind of a, um, what would be a noun or a, a, an analogy to what a declension is? Versus os u o on a. An analogy, huh? or like another, like a, a different word, like a, just a synonym. Like a declension is like a. That's a simile, not a synonym. I always like to think about like a pattern, right? Because like even little kids can make sense of like two, four, six, eight, ten. Oh yeah, that's kind of what a declension is. So there are declensions, like for example. Um, the definite article has its own declension. Ha, to, to, ton, te. Right? Like, it just follows that pattern. That's really all we're talking about there. Um, what's the sequence or what's the pattern? So that when I learn, again, the first, the second, the third, um, or again, some pronouns or the article adjective, they have their own um, pattern, you know, their own declensions that they follow. And so we just kind of learn those patterns. You just kind of know it. So if I see any word, you know, ha lagos or uh, ta pluma plumatas or whatever it is, then I know, okay, that's a third neuter or that's a second masculine or that's a whatever it is. So that's the first thing I want to kind of introduce or like reintroduce that's kind of new. Um, in our recitation, we, we talk about the first declension feminine pure alpha, the first declension feminine pure eta, the first declension feminine mixed, and the first declension masculine. Um, so that's kind of the weird one. Um, only There's only one um, of those first that are masculine. Then we have the second declension masculine and the second declension neuter. And then on the back on the top of the second page, we have the third declension. So I just want to highlight kind of two things that are, that are um, kind of true about the third declension. The first is for third declension nouns, we have to have two forms. So for example, um, in the, the, the actual recitation itself, we have, oops, <laughs> ha archon, archontas. Archon, archontas. Now, the reason why we need these two forms is because if we actually look at the rest of the declension, pardon me, the declension, it goes archon, archontas, archonti, archonta, archon. And the plural continues, archontas, archonta, and etc. So the first thing we kind of notice in the third declension, or maybe, is that often, not always, but very, very often, we actually have different stems. That is, we're adding or subtracting syllables between this nominative 
singular form and this genitive singular form. So, um, and, and you wouldn't be able to just know those uh, with some exception. There are some patterns like um, ma, like soma, somatas, pneuma, pneumatas. So there are some that kind of fit the patterns, but there are so many patterns that you you have to learn a whole bunch of words before you know the patterns. <laughs> like, it's just not, it's not like a, oh, there are like two patterns. No, it's like there are 20 of them. Okay, so that's the one big difference is these nominative singular first forms will actually add or subtract um, when you go into the second uh, genitive singular form. So we had archon, which became archonsos there. Okay, um, so that's one thing maybe we notice is an additional syllable when we come to the genitive form. Um, another thing you might notice, or like if, if you didn't know what you were looking at, we might be tempted and we might see this os, right, and think what declension? Um, second? Second declension masculine, yeah. So I have to know like, oh wait, what declension is this? And that becomes really important when you add the third declension because there's a lot of overlap. So there's like tests, or um, um, a C or E or any Yoda at the end. And so if I don't know what declension I'm looking at, I could think I'm in another declension, and I may go, like, where is that? I, I don't even know what that is. So we have to be on the lookout. The, the last thing that's really important is third declension nouns always build off this genitive form. Only the nominative and vocative actually are this first form, this first dictionary form. Everything else, um, so for example, it doesn't matter if it's masculine, feminine, or neuter, archon, archontos, archonti, archonta, uh, archontes, archontone, they're all building off the genitive form. Same thing in the neuter, soma, somatas, soma si, that was a little, or soma ti, pardon me, soma, soma, and then back, um, because it's a neuter. So if you remember, side note, if you remember the neuter rule, Neuter forms are always identical in the nominative, accusative, and vocative. So that's what we have with soma, soma, soma. But all those other are called, um, what's that muscle called? Ah! All the other non-nominative cases. Oh, dadgummit. What's that called? Re um, anyway, there's some adjective that's specifically for the non-nominative cases, and I can't remember what it is. But anyway, so for the neuter, um, yes, the nominative, accusative, and vocative are still the same. And then again, the plural, nominative, accusative, and vocative. So, somata, somata, somata. But otherwise, those oblique, there it was. I knew it was there. Those oblique cases um, will all be built off that gender form. Okay. So that's one thing that you just kind of have to be aware of. Um, and again, it's there in the recitation, but um, that's one thing. So third declension nouns, you'll know that it's a third declension noun because this genitive singular um, ends in os, and they'll give you both forms rather than just giving you one form, okay? So that's, I think, chapter 17. And, um, yeah, they're super common, super, super, super common, um, all over the place. All right, so those are the substantives. We're going to spend pretty much all of our time, though, is, is wrapping up and kind of trying to put, to some extent, put a bow on our verbs. So first, we're going to talk about um, kind of what these different attributes are of verbs um, before we actually even get into the Greek, the actual like Greek forms and stuff, um, how, you, how you conjugate them. Um, but we're going to build this tense timeline fully out for the indicative mood. Okay? So just like we did for nouns, what are the different things that we could say about verbs? When it happens. Okay, good. And what do we call that? Category. Um, tense. Good, tense. And tonight we're going to kind of dig in a little bit further on that into two, two um, different ideas that are present in tense. The first we can call the time of the verb or the when of the verb. Um, and in one sense we got to think of there being like three times. Like there's the before now, there's the now, and there's the not yet kind of thing. Um, so usually people call those like past, present, and future. Um, but that can be confusing because those are actually, <laughs> some of those are actually tenses. So we're just going to call it before, now, and later. Uh, if you'd like, you can call it after too. I think that gets the same idea across. 
So that's one aspect, uh, or probably one kind of piece of tenses. The second piece of tenses is the is called the how, um, where we could say like in what way is it done, um, and that is called the aspect of the tense. See, in my head, I think of this being like discrete or continuous, like it's yes. sort of like a yes. single point. That is totally, yeah, so those, uh, those adjectives like punctiliar or iterative or imperfect or uh, perfect or complete or things like that, yes, that's exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. And, and that, those are really kind of the three ways you could think of it. You could think of it as, uh, you said, you said uh, ongoing, is that one of the ones you said? Continuous. Was yeah, continuous, that's great. So continuous or uh, ongoing, good. And then you said discrete, mm -hmm. uh, completed? Yeah, same general idea. Same general idea. And then um, yeah, there are others, but like iterative, like it happens again and again and again and again kind of thing. So, um, and then there are others like an emphatic or an intensive that maybe shifts a little bit, but anyway. So yeah, that's really what you're talking about with the aspect. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when, when we think about verbs, um, we're not aware, even in English, like, even in English, we're not aware of, like, the nuances of, like, I had gone to home when I saw my cat or whatever. Like, we're not aware, like, why did I say had there? Like, we're just not, in, you know, we're not aware of, like, wait a second, did I need that had there? What, what did that had add? Or what, what would that had take away if I didn't have it there? So that's, that's really what we're going to spend this time on. That's why this timeline is here. Um, then what else is there? So there's tense. Active, passive, and middle. Do you remember what those are called? Um, no. That's all right. Voice. Voice, right? And that's all about the subject's relationship to the verb, right? Is the subject doing the verb um, active, right? It's an active subject. Is the subject receiving the verb? It's a passive. Is the subject doing the verb to itself? It's middle. Okay, so active, middle, and passive. Um, that's the voice of the verb. And then there's the mood. We haven't really dug into this much. Um, but do you remember any moods from your Latin days? No. That's okay. So the, the, the main one I would kind of highlight is like the imperative, like go home, versus like he is going home. So that's just the imperative command mood versus the indicative. Um, it's not, there's not a great way to define the indicative, except for to compare it with, <laughs> there's another way to define things is to just compare it. The other kind of infamous mood is the subjunctive. That's the mood of possibility or potentiality. Um, so I might head home after class. You know, it's like, oh, will you, won't you? So anyway, everything for us so far is indicative, um, which again, doesn't mean a ton on its own, honestly, <laughs> except for that it's not an imperative or a subjunctive. Um, all right, and then the last two are person and number, right? Person and number, singular or plural would be number. Um, person is that like first, second, or third, right? Is it the, the, the speaker is the actor, the speaker is looking at the actor, or the speaker is talking about the actor, so to speak. Okay. All right, so we're going to zoom in on tenses uh, and really kind of draw this up for us. We've got a couple more colors here. Things will work. All right. Um, so verb tenses. First tense you learn. Um, present active. Present. Yeah. Good. Present. Um, and the present. Think of our translations. We could say things like "I destroy" or "I am destroying." Right. Mm -hmm. And in the Greek, those would both be expressed with the form "luo." Right. So "I destroy" kind of simple, uh, simple action versus "I am destroying." Uh, that like continuous or ongoing action. Uh, you can also see an emphatic, like I do in fact destroy, but very rarely. Um, so those would be the two for the present part, present tense. And they happen now, right? That's, that's usually, if you ask people like, what, what do they mean by present? They would say, oh, it means it's happening now. But notice we have different ways we could kind of emphasize that. I am running home now versus I run home. Oh, you're emphasizing the nowness or the ongoingness of it versus just the simple action itself. Okay? I think the next verb tense we learned was the imperfect, right? Mm -hmm. What was that about? Um, like, it's not completed. It's like 
past. Yeah. So it's in the past, right? So it's just before now, and it's imperfect, not complete. Um, that's all perfect means. So it's this ongoing arrow, or again, or that like iterative thing. Like I would often go to the park or something like that. So that's the imperfect. Um, and we added that nice little, um, nice little augment, right? Elowan, Elowan. My name kind of looks like an epsilon. All right. So we saw that. Then, do you remember the next tense we added? Mm -hmm. It's the one that's after now. Um, future. Future. There we go. All right. So then we get the future. In the future, we saw these same two kinds of aspects. I will travel or I will be traveling. Uh, or, you know, I will, uh, whatever. So that, again, um, emphasizing the on, oops, as I write, imperfect. <laughs> All right, future, we're emphasizing that um, not yetness uh, or not simpleness, this ongoing nature of it. Okay. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to add three more tenses, not because I expect it like perfect tonight, obviously, um, but just so we can kind of map them out here and understand how Greek uses these tenses. Um, because I think there are, there are a lot of um, errors that happen. Um, I hate to tell people to listen to their pastors and wait for the errors, but this would be an area where you would hear them. Okay. So... The tense we're going to talk about tonight, kind of officially in the next lesson, is the aorist tense. The aorist tense, what that word means, just like imperfect meant not done or not complete, or we could say it the other way, ongoing. Aorist means not defined. It means not defined. But before we kind of try to get a sense of what the aorist means, I actually want to introduce it, the, the next tense the, book's te the book teaches you, which is it's called the perfect tense. So if the imperfect meant not complete or ongoing, what would the perfect mean? Complete. Complete. Okay. And there's actually a really important, like, second idea. So it doesn't, I could put this anywhere on the timeline in the past. But the big somewhat of the perfect is that it's complete with, um, with an impact on the present. So, for example, I have arrived. I'm not just saying like eight weeks ago, I got somewhere. What I'm actually saying is I am there right now. So sometimes when you actually read translations of, of um, the Greek Bible, uh, Leluca, sorry, Leluca, they will actually translate this as a present because the emphasis of the perfect tense is on the fact that it still has a present effect on you. Okay, I'll use a really bad example, and I'm glad you're sitting over there. So before I came, I ate chicken wings. Okay? <laughs> you could tell that I ate chicken wings if you sat close to me. So watch. Uh, this is what my dad used to ask me every day on the way to school. He'd say, have you brushed your teeth? He is not asking, like, eight months ago, did you brush your teeth? He is saying, if I smelled your breath right now, what would it smell like? You know what I mean? Like, have you showered? You know, I, I, my oldest boy is now, like, getting into his, like, stinky ears. Um, and, like, you can smell him. Like, you can just smell him if he hasn't showered and put on deodorant. That's what the perfect is emphasizing, is was there this past tense event that has a present tense effect on you? So you'll see that when you get to, I think it's lesson 14, or chapter 14, pardon me. You'll see a lot of them translated as like presence. Like, for example, patho, papetha. Patho means like, um, uh, uh, I persuade. Um, or, 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 no, I'm sorry, I feel. I feel. So as a perfect, it would be almost something like, I have felt. But you'll see it translated as almost like, I have conviction about. Like, I, I am convinced that. I am convinced. And so if you saw it just in the English, you would actually think like, oh, that's a present tense verb. I am convinced. But it's actually a tense that communicates this past thing still stands with me today. Right? Um, Martin Luther, in one of his letters, um, 
he gets he gets asked uh, about like doubt. I'm trying to remember the exact context, but I think it's a prince who is who has written to him and is asking him like, "How do I know I'm still a Christian?" And Luther just responds, "When I uh, when I doubt, I remember be uh, baptismi. Be baptismi. I think is the the perfect um, middle. I have been baptized. So it's not just this past thing, but like." It still has a present effect on me. I don't doubt because I remember my baptism. Not like way in the past, but like I have put on Christ, so to speak. Okay? So there's no English equivalent for this exactly? There is. We're just so sloppy with our tenses. So like really, that's what the have is supposed to communicate. I, uh, where are you at? I've, I've gotten us a table. Right? And you're sitting at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there, to that point, you might actually say in English, I, um, um, I got us a table. But that's weird if you said, I got us a table, like, well, are you still there? Mm-hmm. And so this is one of the places where when you read authors who have been trained in like Latin and Greek, they just have a sensitivity to, oh, wait, when I use have, that's actually communicating the, the, the presentness of this past action. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So that's one of the great things, at least for me, like one of the things that I've really come to appreciate is even in my own tenses, being aware of like, oh, wait, is this, is this a perfect situation where I want to actually say like, um, like there's a, a song I grew up with, like in youth group uh, by, and they said, uh, don't you know I've always loved you? I have always loved you. And I still love you now, right? Like, not just like, way back in the past, I used to love you. But like, right now, I still, I still love you, um, kind of a thing. So, so that's the perfect. So the imperfect was about not complete. The perfect is about complete with a present effect. Um, I, I have uh, had some water. I haven't. So here we go, ready? Mm. Uh, good, I've had a drink. Feel the saliva in my mouth. I've got a drink. Okay, so it's got that present effect. Okay, so let's use that to kind of set the stage for this other tense, which is often, I think, misunderstood, is called the aorist tense. And I'm going to draw it with a circle, kind of go back to like old number lines. <laughs> of like, aorist literally means not done, or, or really, sorry, it really means not defined. Not defined. It is just saying this thing happened. It's actually a way to not emphasize the undoneness or the doneness. It means not defined. Um, Whereas, again, the perfect emphasis, this this thing is completed, it's done. The aorist, it it doesn't mean that it's, it's not done. It's just saying in the past, you know, almost like a once upon a time there was a king. Well, well, how long was he king? It doesn't matter. It's just, it's back there somewhere, you know. And that's not to say it doesn't matter. Um, where were we? We were, um, ah, the benediction in, was it in Revelation 1? Yeah, in Revelation 1. It's a participle there. But um, it just says, like, he he loved you, or, uh, I think is how, how uh, the verb, I'm trying to remember what the verb is. But anyway, it's just an aorist participle. It's not saying, like, he has loved you and still loves you today. It's just saying, Jesus loved you. Now, it's not, <laughs> this is where we get in trouble. We don't need to over-exegete the text, right? We don't need to be like, see, and he doesn't love you because they didn't use a perfect tense. No, 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 no. Like, don't do that. It's a super-duper common, simple past tense that's used in Greek. So the way I would think about the aorist, um, and this is what we're going to get to today, so we'll go with, um, actually, we'll go with two. We'll go with uh, Elusa, and we'll talk about why there are two, or uh, Elabon. So we'll talk about the first and the second heiress today, uh, kind of what that is. But really, I, I would think of the heiress, and I would encourage people to think of the heiress as like just your generic go-to tense. It is like the English simple past tense. I swam today. I'm not talking about you know a long swim or a short swim. I'm just telling you it happened. You know, that, that's what I did. And it, the aorist kind of functions in a similar way. So the way that you could treat the aorist wrong is by trying to make it say more than it wants to say 
or trying to say it doesn't matter and it's not really a big deal. And if it was a big deal, they would have used a perfect or an imperfect. That's not it. It's just a simple past tense. Communicate something happened with no emphasis, one way or the other, on a present effect, nor an emphasis of like an ongoing or repeated action. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and again, in English, almost always these will just be simple past tense. He washed, he uh, looked around, you know, something like that. Um, nothing big. All right, the uh, last tense that actually shows up in our recitation is the pluperfect. So the pluperfect, um, the word actually comes from a Latin word, plus quam perfectum, literally more than done. I always think of it as like an overcooked hamburger, the more extra crispy, well done past tense. And that is our backstop tense. So the pluperfect I always draw as like a hard line at the back. It's the, the backstop tense. And the way that it works is it always, whenever it comes out, it always serves as the, the backmost, the, the, the uh, most far in the past tense that sets the scene for like a story. Um, and in English, we use the, the helping, uh, the helper had, the tense helper had. Like, when I had arrived at the airport and, imperfect, was checking my bags in, I saw, aorist, uh, my cousin or whatever, okay? So the pluperfect, which is the same, uh, if you look at it, it'd be the same as the perfect plus an augment up front. L This uh, with different endings, but the big so what is it? It's an augment on a perfect. Because just like an augment on a present shifts us into the past, an augment on a perfect shifts the perfect into the past even further. So there's kind of a logic there to, to how that augment works. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the tense timeline of how this works. And you can kind of get a sense like, Wow, look at all these past tenses we have versus like a present versus like a future or a future perfect. Um, a future perfect would just talk about, um, it would be talk about a thing that's going to happen and it's not covered in 1 to 17. But it would, it would say like, when we, we, you almost never see it translated this way, but it'd be like, when we will have arrived in Texas, we will go to sleep. You would never see it translated. You'd always see it as like, when, oh, it would sound like a present. When we arrive in Texas, we will go to sleep. Um, so it sounds like a present, but that's just because it's setting the stage for this other future event. So that's called the future perfect. Um, so I don't think we covered the second aorist very much. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Oh, okay. okay, so that's what we're going to zoom in. So, so first, I just want to kind of get this sketch of like, this is kind of the when and the so what of the tenses, the uh, indicative tenses in Greek. That's kind of it, okay? Um, perfect emphasizes the present effect of a past. Imperfect emphasizes the ongoingness of a past event um, or a repeatedness of a past event. The aorist emphasize, doesn't emphasize at all, just simple. The pluperfect emphasizes the super, super pastness of a thing relative to other past tenses. So again, on the stage, um, you can always see it in a narrative, like it's not always the first clause, but it's, it's the first clause, <laughs> you know? Like, when he had been raised, he traveled to, you know, Galilee or whatever. Okay, so that's the tense timeline, good deal? All right, let's talk about, um, in particular, the aorist. So the aorist, like I said, is Super, super, super common. Um, it is rare to see a parable or any kind of narrative in Koine Greek where you would not see aorists. They are super, duper, duper common. Um, and they're relatively easy to spot. So we're going to zoom in on that. So first, when we do our principal parts, so good old Luo. Luo, 
Luso, Elusa, Leluca, Lelumai, Lelumai, Eluthing. Okay. So there's six principal parts. Um, the reason why we always use Luo is because it's, it's a nice stable verb and you kind of see what's going on. Okay. Luo. We use Luo for, do you remember what two tenses we saw? It's present and um, the second tense we learned as well, imperfect. Imperfect. So that first principal part, we, we saw a present active indicative and a present middle passive indicative. Then we saw an imperfect active and an imperfect middle passive indicative. Okay. The second one, luso, do you remember what that was for? Future, good. And this one is just the future active or middle. You don't have to worry about that a ton today, but the last principal part, this is actually giving us, we actually find the future off, the future passive off of this. We don't need to worry about that today, but that's where it's hidden, or that's, that's where it is, okay? Um, and you could kind of see that if you like dug into your recitation, you would actually see it. It's um, luthesomai, luthesai. So that you drop the augment and drop the new, and you, you have it right there, okay? All right, so then we got Elusa, and that's kind of where we are tonight. So this third principal part is the aorist principal part for the aorist active and the aorist middle, okay? Let me finish the principal parts, and then we'll come back to this third principal part. So Leluca is used for the perfect active, and Lelumai is used for the perfect, oops, perfect middle uh, passive. And then last but not least, Eleuthane is used for the aorist uh, passive. Oops, passive. Okay, so we're not gonna worry about those tonight. Um, once you get these first three principal parts, you're dealing with, I'll make up a percentage, 75 plus percent of verbs. If you added participles, you're dealing with 85 plus percent of verbs and verbals. They're just, this is very, very dominant. Okay, so the aorist. I'm gonna put up here a second verb. Um, lumbano, lampsamai, just <laughs> ignore the fact that it does that for its second form, uh, and elevon. All right. All right, so. We kind of talked about like what the aorist is. It just means not defined, right? But then we come across this thing, like in the recitation, you already kind of clued in on it, that some aorists are first aorists, and some aorist verbs take their aorist tense in what's called the second aorist. And this is kind of like a declension. That's not a bad way to think of it, I, I, I don't think. Um, First aorists, or verbs that take their aorist form in the first aorist forms, they, in their third principal part, will always end in the first letter of the Greek alphabet. That's not really the rule. That's just how you remember it. So when I come to the third principal part, luo, luso, elusa, and I see that alpha there, that's a first aorist. First letter of the alphabet, first aorist. And they'll very often have that sigma in front of them. Sorry, my brown's dying on me. And then those to, uh, conjugate, pardon me, elusa, elusas, elusa, elusamen, elusita, elusan. Okay? The, lots of alphas in there. The other option is I go lumbano, lampsamai, Elabon, oh, it's a different ending, and it's going to be this on ending. Now, can you remember? We've seen that on ending before. With that augment, even. El, on. I was thinking of Arkham, but then you added Oh, no, okay. Well, we saw it with Eldawan. So this is one, this is one thing where it's going to get really tricky. So a second heiress is going to have these on. There are actually a couple other options, but... We'll just stick to on for today. Like, it's not the alpha. 
And if you look at the endings, it actually goes Elabon, Elabes, Elabe, Elabaman, Elabate, Elabon. Those are the identical endings we would see for the imperfect active indicative. That's tricky, okay? But it, what we've got to keep in mind, pardon me, is am I building, where am I building off of? So for example, I, if I know my principal parts, I know that it's luo, luso, elusa. And if I saw, for example, if I saw eluon, I would have to go, wait a second. This could be a second aorist form. Or this could be the imperfect form. And my question then goes to, well, what's the third principal part of the verb? Oh, it's elusa. That's a first aorist. It takes its forms, its aorist forms, in the first aorist. Um, again, you can think of it as like the first aorist declension. I know declensions go with nouns and adjectives, but it'll work. It follows this sa 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 thing, not the on s a thing of the second aorist. And so when we see those forms, those uh, again, this like eloan form. We have to be aware of, again, we've got options. We could have a second aorist option, and then I just have to know, well, what are the principal parts? Lombano, lame, so my elevon. <gasps> Boom, there it is. Because what would the, can you figure out, what would the imperfect be of this? So put an augment on lumbano. Oh, lumbano. Good. Oops. Oops. A lumbanon, right? So we go, oh, look, look, there it is. Look, that's built off of lumbano versus elabon. And so when we get to these aorists, especially I think a lot of second aorists, you'll see certain uh, either, either uh, syllables dropping out or syllables being added. And that's one of the trickiest aspects of Greek, I think. When people complain about like how hard Greek is, it can get really wonky with these principal parts. And so I remember in grad school, like literally have, in undergrad, um, having like sheets of common verbs and you would just recite the principal parts and just pray that that's stuck in your mind somehow. You know, because you're like, oh my gosh, what are these principal parts? So learning those ends up being a really important part of it. Or, I mean, the good news is, is if you're using like a, com a computer program or even like that reader's Greek New Testament, it'll flag it. It'll just say like second aorist of Lombano or something, which is really nice. Like, great. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah. Um, because it ends up being just a search for like, oh man, finding, for example, Lampsomai, which is this deponent future of Lombano, finding that, like if I'm using a dictionary, it's going to be a while until I go to lum, you know, lambda alpha if I've got a lambda eta. Woo, good luck finding it. And so that's one of the areas where like Greek students can get, you can get really thrown off the trail when it does like big shift kind of things. Um, even the same thing with elabon. Like, I, I don't know, unless I know that, I, I'm not going to know that comes from lumbano, you know. So one thing you'll notice is in your book, really starting in, um, I think chapter, let's see, chapter 13 is um, they, well, one thing they do in 13 is they, they just tell you for certain verbs you already know, they'll tell you um, what they are. So like starting on page uh, 73, pempo, a pempsa, blepo, a blepsa. Um, and so that kind of looks familiar with like that, that C coming from the sigma. Grafo, agrupsa, agrupsa, pardon me. Um, so some of those should look kind of uh, similar or familiar to you, um, though you were seeing them before actually in the future sigma, right? And now it's actually a first era sigma. So you've got the augment on the front, past tense shifter, plus a sigma, okay? Um, and then in the next chapter, lesson 14, um, this is what I was thinking of, sorry. When you come to the second aorist, these are the ones, like I said, that look really different. So for example, idon, harao, oh my goodness, the principal parts of harao, harao, opsomai, um, adon, or I, uh, pardon me, idon. Man, if you see idon, the only thing is it's so common. It's so common. Uh, same thing, 
Lego, uh, Lego, oh, what's the second principal part of Lego? I will speak. I can't think of it. There you go. Um, but the third principal part is uh, Apen, Apen. Lego to Apen. How would I know that? You would, you know, except for that's just a super common verb, you know. So that's kind of the benefit you have is like I say is all over the place, all, all over the place. So um, anyway, so this comes where uh, Erikamai, oh my goodness, Erikamai, Elusamai, Aelthon. Uh, woo! Yeah, so you just like, you recite these things a ridiculous amount of times. And again, you see some of them so, so common. These second eras are very, very common. Um, so that's, so if you, on the lesson 14, all I have to say is when you look at the lesson 14 vocab, like half of them are literally just like the third principal parts of verbs you already know. You just didn't, you know, you didn't know that what that was. So from that point on, really in the book, uh, 14, 15, 16, all you're doing is like adding these principal parts. Um, and so if you, if you were a vocab card user, um, like I was back in the day, cause I would just take walks and learn vocab. Um, you know, you just go back to all your vocab cards and add those six principal parts. And not every verb has six principal parts. Um, some have three, some have four, um, some have six. Um, but if you need those in the back of the book, you could look them up. So if you th think like, oh man, um, let's see, decamai, sure, I receive. Decamai, dexamai, oh, that's pretty normal. Um, a dexamine, oh man, what is that? A dexamine, huh, a dexamine. What do you notice there? A dexamine. Can you spot where that's coming from? Well, let me go back to the first one, decamai. Decamai. I thought it was supposed to be like deco or something. Yeah, I should probably have an example, but I can't. No, it's okay. So, but what, what are those amai endings? Do you remember? Amai, a, a tie, amethyst, the anti. That's okay. So it's, it's, actually a, it's actually a passive form first. So if it lists the passive or the middle passive form first, do you remember what that tells you about the verb? It looks passive, but then the translation is I receive. Right. Do you remember what we call that category? No. Deponent. Totally fine. So, so that's actually what we have in those forms, is we actually have all these deponent forms. So uh, um, amain, um, uh, with an alpha, amain, that is actually a first aorist middle form. It looks passive but it would still be translated actively, I received or I accepted or something like that, okay? So when you look at them, that's where there's that like, almost like soft eyes. In some verbs, oh my goodness, like lumbano, it actually jumps back and forth from an active lumbano, I, um, I uh, throw, lumbano? Yeah, that's right. I was like, hold on, that's right. Um, to lame semi, deponent, future. So. Just to make it even more complicated, this is what we call a semi-deponent, a half-deponent. Sometimes it's deponent, sometimes it's not a deponent. Um, good times. So, so that's where like having kind of those eyes to go, wait, what is this? Oh, it's a future. How do I know? That C there, and it's built off of lamp semi versus like a lumbano. Oh, but it's off of lamp semi. That's a middle form. That means it's a deponent. That means all my forms on this will be middle, or um, um, yeah, all my forms will be middle, but I'll still translate them actively, like I will receive or something like that. Okay. And that's tricky. So the big so what of the aorist is when I go to my third principal part, I'm looking for is this a first aorist and it's going to take those first forms, or is it a second aorist and it's going to take those second aorist forms? Um, and then from there, it's just, okay, identifying, for example, I had an elabeth. Oh, that epsilon coming off of elub, not elumb, but elub. Oh, that's an aorist coming off of that. Now it's a second aorist, active indicative, third person singular. Something like that. Okay? Whew. It's a lot, though. I know that's a lot. And that's what Greek, I mean, you know, there's a reason why Shakespeare said it's Greek to me, not it's Latin to me. It's because I think, like, Greek keeps you very, very much like on your feet. 
um, like stuff like this. Now Latin actually does that as well. There are actually semi-deponent verbs. I know it's been a while since you study Latin. <laughs> but there actually are semi-deponent verbs um, that, again, verbs that kind of jump from active looking and active translated to uh, passive looking and active translated. Um, it's just Greek is so full of them. Um, and it feels like, I would say, as a, as a Greek student, it feels to me like the really nice thing about um, coming into Greek after Latin is I'm already familiar with the idea that like nouns decline and the whole like case thing, right? Um, I'm familiar with the idea that the verbs, like they conjugate luo, lues, lue. Um, what's hard in Greek, in my opinion, what's hard in Greek is really being rock solid on these principal parts and then really knowing like, hey, this is what I build off of each principal part. I've got to really pay attention to whether it's it's truly to you know deponent the whole way through or true like a, a, a normal active verb the whole way through, or whether it's doing the semi deponent thing the whole way through. Um, and so that's where I would say when you're you know reading Greek or looking at a Greek Bible or whatever you know having those those tools that help you out with like hey what are the principal parts of this verb become really really important um, because otherwise. Um, again, you see a form, uh, so let's look at it. Let's look at lesson 13, uh, number one. So I'm going to encourage you before we push ourselves a little bit. Um, can you see a noun in the nominative? Um, Good, yeah, so I know, what is it? Teacher. The teacher, good. So I know the teacher is my subject. Um, and just one more, uh, Tan Achlan. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that? The multitude. Yeah. In what case is it in? Um, oh, I think you said looking for like a noun. Or did you mean looking for like a noun? Oh, there I just looked, grabbed another noun. Okay. It, I'll give you a hint. It comes from Ha Achlas. Oh, that's right, I'll call us. Then it's uh, accusative. Good. All right. So in a nutshell, right, as I look at this sentence, um, and, and I, I like the idea of, like, my, my eyes are kind of like vacuum cleaners. Like, they suck up a lot of things. Sometimes they don't know what they sucked up. Sometimes they do. So I see pretty clearly there this, like, subject, direct object thing, right? The teacher is doing something to the multitude. It, that's my guess, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've got our verb right there in the middle, right? A pelusa. All right. So what I'm not concerned about right now, just for kind of the, the purpose of this example, um, I'm not concerned about like the actual, oops, the actual translation as much as I'm concerned about like what do you notice uh, with regard to a pelusa? What do you see? I would have guessed future because of the sigma. Okay, good. So you see a sigma. And that sigma, oh gosh, this is why I love this stuff. So that sigma, in, before tonight, that sigma tells you future, right? Mm -hmm. But now, what else could it be? Well, if the epsilon in the middle, but it's in the middle, which is kind of throwing me. Okay, but hold on. Stick to the sigma for now. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so we'll You're just a normal, normal student. So what else do you know now that sigma could tell you? Um, that it could be an aorist. Yeah, that's exactly right. So my, right, my options have multiplied, which is on the one hand good uh, because if I only had the future, hint, hint, uh, I'd be wrong. So now I've got more options for what that sigma could be, um, but I don't know what it is. Yet. Okay, you, then you said there's something else you saw. Yeah. The, what? The epsilon. Good, the epsilon. Now that epsilon, what, do you remember what we call that? Augment. Good, so that is an augment, and it tells you what? Um, that, well, normally I might think like imperfect, but okay. here we have both future and imperfect. Good, good. So, if we went in, even if we went like forward in class, it, it really the augment just tells us past tense, right? Pastness. So that could be the imperfect, that could be the uh, 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 pluperfect, or that could be the aorist. 
Okay? And so now, right, we put together our two clues. We actually know what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Which? It's a first or second, you mean? Oh, oh, sorry. I just mean, like, what is it? Is it an imperfect, a pluperfect, oh, an aorist? Yeah. Why? Um, because we have both epsilon. Good. Th that's exactly right. So th this is why I love it's it's like a, it's like a Sherlock Holmes, right? Like if I only notice one clue, I could be in trouble. But when I notice, wait, I've got an augment and a sigma. Well, the augment tells me pastness, and the sigma tells me future or aorist. It's got to be an aorist mm -hmm. because futures wouldn't have an augment, right? It'd be apoluso or say say sounds like it, right? Um, so even before now, if we if we had to, there is actually a third clue, which is what. Maybe if we knew what the stem was. Oh, okay, I'll give you a hint. So the future would be apoluso, apoluses, apoluse, apolusamen, apolusate, apolususi. The last clue is the ending. Okay. So in the future, we don't ever have an, just an epsilon as an ending. Does that kind of make sense? So we actually have there two options, the imperfect or the aorist, the first aorist specifically. Okay. So again, just more evidence, right, of like, well, shoot, if I only noticed those two things, I'd be stuck between an imperfect or an aorist. If I noticed uh, these two, I'd notice aorist. If I notice all three, again, only aorist would fit for all three of those categories. Uh, Man, just mind's trained on this. It's just, it's just amazing because you're, you know, you're multiplying categories. I mean, it's like, it's a, a, a species identification, right? Like, well, I see this, this, and this. Well, if it was this species, I wouldn't see this. Okay, so that one's out, right? That kind of thing. Ah, I love it. Process of elimination and multiplying of options. So, so that's what's going on there. So, as we, again, translate a sentence, there are going to be those areas that. Um, that they just jump out to you, like Tata had to had to daskalas. Then the teacher, something, the crowd, right? And like that's why some sometimes, and I don't think it's I don't think it's evil to say, but sometimes teachers will say like find all the verbs, and that's not a bad thing to say, but especially when you're getting into like more complex sentences like this, where it's like the verb may be the hardest thing to actually figure out what it is. Now again. I, I might, you know, I might be able to get close and, and again, just kind of use like some kind of generic, you know, filler verb in English. But I often find in Greek that it's easier, for example, if we just complete, continue that sentence, then the teacher blanked the crowd and blanked uh, to his house, right? And the verbs, I, I would, and I would say just as a teacher, most Greek students, the verbs would be the hardest thing. Whereas if I go, well, gosh, I've got a clear nominative, a clear accusative, then conjunction chi, and then just a prepositional phrase to his house. Oh, cool. Now I'm just trying to figure out what those two verbs are and then how to translate them correctly, right? And then I'm going to kind of zoom in on them just like this. I see my sigma. I see my, uh, my ending. I see my augment. And I see the same thing with hupostrepho on the second verb, right? So once I've, once I've kind of cleared the first verb, <laughs> I have a pretty good guess about what that second verb is. Because, I, again, I see the same thing, right? I see augment, the sp, and then that movable new on the, the epsilon at the end. So, anyway, so that's, that's in general how I, I would recommend um, kind of trying to attack those sentences. Um, because you just, you have to really pay attention, careful, careful attention to these verbs. Um, and again, this one's pretty straightforward because you can kind of tell it comes from apoluo. Um, but again, if it, if, if it was a major um, stem change, it would slow you down all the more. And I'm a big believer that like we are very emotional things. And if I've like got the whole sentence translated except for two verbs, I'm like, okay, all right, here we go. I got everything done except for two verbs, you know, and then I can kind of tackle it. Um, so that's it, man. That's the big so what of these verbs. Um, Again, memorizing the, the endings, you know, that are there in the recitation, I think, are important. Um, and then the second thing is, is again, just 
just starting to, or again, using a, a dictionary or a little glossary like this to know what those principal parts are, um, because then you're able to kind of build off of, like, where's it coming from? Oh, okay, this is coming off of a future, or this is coming off of, this is the aorist. Oh, is it a first aorist or second aorist? Oh, I see the alpha, first letter, first aorist, uh, versus not. Okay.